Hello, and welcome to the MBS show. It is I, the mustache twirling villain and mastermind, Jakob von Tolkad. And this time, I've staged a coup. <laughs> and here next to me, next to uh, uh, what seems to be a wilting Christmas tree, I think, is Norman Sanzo. Hi. Um, I, I've meant to throw out the tree, but it felt festive, so I decided to keep up for a bit until it kind of rots and dies. Wait, I don't think it will, because it's plastic. Uh... Ask the other guy to check out for me, Jacob. Did you put it next to the heat or something? No comments. Alright. And we also have the leader of the Court of the Blue Balls of Zinch, Silver Quill. That's right, all will bow before his chaotic all knowing blue balls. <laughs> for they are the architects of destiny? Wait, what? He's talking about the his architects own of. Oh god. The, the architects of destiny? <laughs> yeah. And last but not least, we have a very special guest joining us for this occasion Commander Firebrand, aka Just Scorcher. Hello, I am not the least, I am uh, just one step up. <laughs> now. To the to the listeners, you're probably wondering why uh, what is this? Now let's just say that uh, well, the holiday gods of the previous month have now been particularly uh, uh, how do I put it? Pleasant. Kind. To, yeah, kind to any any one of us. For both Norbert and Josh, actually. So we sort of had to move. Uh, this uh, bit to middle of January, but uh, well, we'll try to make do for what we have. Anyway, today we are reviewing the Asterix comic. <coughs> well, well, sorry, sorry, that was uh, a slip up over there. Uh, we're reviewing uh, Asterix, the animated movie, Asterix and the Britons. Now, for those who are unaware, uh, to those American listeners and some and somewhere else. Uh, Asterix uh, is a British-Belgian comic series uh, which talk about uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and talk about the adventures of Asterix and his friend Obelix in the era of the Roman Empire after it conquered uh, all of France. Back then it was known as Gaul. And uh, well, we are reviewing, as I said, uh, Asterix and the Britons. So, uh, for first impressions, let's just move on to that. Uh, Norman, oh, what yes. do you got to say? Um, <clears throat> well, when we first got this project right, uh, you, you handed me the comics and I take a look, see at it, and it didn't felt, uh, I would say, festive in terms of Christmas. It's more of a uh, Valentine's kind of thing. But then you mentioned that it's not even that, and as we discuss, oh, okay, let's do the animated movie. And when we did the animated movie, um, the first download I got was in France. So I decided, oh no, uh, let me try find an English version of this available on the YouTubes. So I downloaded that and watched it, and uh, pff, oof, it was rough. It was rough for me. And yeah, th th that's my first impressions. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Uh, Silver, what about you? Well, I did watch the uh, Le Francais version because it was high quality, but oddly timed subtitles. Mm. But I know, I remember Asterix from my childhood. There was at least one cartoon that found its way over to American shores that I caught. Uh, it was not this one, however. Well, this one. Which one was it? Uh, let's see. Let's see here. Two of Asterix's uh, fellow uh, village members are captured by the Romans, and he and Obelisk embark on a quest to free them, uh, bringing them into... Ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's one I do know. It's uh, Asterix versus Caesar. And yes, they come directly into conflict with the Caesar, the Caesar and not the salad. Mm. But... Uh, this one, this one's a very different feel to it. If anything, I feel like Asterix is in the background quite a bit. 
and it's mostly three tracks of humor. Pip, pip, I'm British, eh, what? Uh, Then there's the incompetence of the Roman military and obelisks. I almost said obelisk. He does torment. It's like... (laughs) It's like every scene he's in, he's he's pushing most of the humor, and I'm just like, dude, back off a little, just just tone it down a bit, for the love of God. <laughs> All right, and what about you, Josh? Uh, well, I was looking at a lot of the uh, the animation in the movie uh, at Asterix in Britain, like. So it's really funny. Like I was first introduced in, to Asterisk when I was uh, in Kenya, and mm. like I was introduced to, to it by uh, by Britons, by by <laughs> British people and Australians, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, it seemed like oh man, if I was a little kid, I would have eaten this up. Like, and eventually I realized, like, yeah, it's just like in France, like Asterisk is huge like because you know it's a it's about the gauls it's about uh the people for it's like people who were in france and you know they're outwitting the superior romans through like trickery it's like it's like he's the he's their speedy gonzalez you know and it's a. Uh, it's it's really like I've seen a lot of uh, asterisk media. I've seen like uh, I've seen like the live action <laughs> asterisk. The, it is and, and honestly, the live action asterisk is actually pretty funny because they have to get these live action people to act like cartoon characters, and they actually do a pretty decent job. <laughs> and. But yeah, I've seen the, a lot of the, a little bit of the TV show, and I didn't. I actually didn't know that they made like TV movies, but I'm also really not surprised. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, the animation for this, like especially for the time, is is really good. Like it's got a good sense of timing. And even though I watched the French version, I didn't. I really didn't need to. Like, I mean, I picked up on a few words here and there, but. It's like I didn't need to completely understand the language in order to get a lot of the jokes, which is pretty good. And, I mean, there are certain things about the animation that are, you know, products of the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like uh, certain uh, stereotypical ways of uh, drawing <laughs> certain ethnicities. But, you know, it's just like, uh, what a... It's, it is really it is really weird watching that now, but you know it's just like eh, at the time they didn't know better. Like let, let's give them a break. I'll just remind everybody: this movie came out in November twentieth of nineteen eighty seven. Yeah, twenty years after the comic came out, and that's the dub version. If you want the French version, it's December third and nineteen eighty six. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it was the eighties. It's like no, it's like no one really cared about being politically correct. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, this and now I can't. And now I can't enjoy any of my favorite cartoons because I'm like, oh god, <laughs> oh god, they did that. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, uh, just to oh, cite real life. everybody. Oh, Sorry, but... just to cite real everybody, right? Like when we watch this now with our mindset of the 2020s and whatnot, going back to this, do we feel like, oh, I, nye, 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 they should have done that, me? Not really. Yeah, it's like, I, I, it's just like, when you when you look back at that, it's just like, uh, whatever. It's just like, you know, it was, it's just like you, I don't know, I guess, I guess from where I'm sitting, just like, I can kind of separate, like, okay, that was a product of the time, you know what, it just like, let's, it's, it's a little, it's just, okay, that was weird, it's like, address it, move on. Good to know. Silver, you? Well, I'm of the view that right and wrong don't change with the times or the culture. Uh, but there are a great many blinders in place that can make it hard for us to distinguish. So drawing folks that way was wrong. 
but there were a lot of blinders at the time. So it's not like these were evil people, but we we know better now. Mm. So I think it's important to put them. It's important to reinforce the message. This was wrong. Yeah. But at the same time, don't give in to this moral superiority because we still are working with blinders. Oh yes, mm. we are definitely working. We're definitely working with blinders, and there is that arrogance that a lot of people do have of today. It's just like, oh, I would never have stood for that back then, or I never would have been this back then. It's just like. Yeah, and those are often the people who would have done that back then because mm-hmm. they, yeah, it's because let's be honest, people don't like to think that they're bad people. No, no one likes to think they're a bad person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And while it does come from, it's like I mean, yeah, while it is good, like okay, yeah, you you see something that's wrong and you acknowledge something that's wrong, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's just like, dude, don't pretend like it's like. There are things that you probably do now that uh, 40, 40 years from now, people are going to look back on you. It's like, man, what a freaking psycho. Oh, yep, yep. <laughs> what are you talking about? People say that about me right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you also have I to don't... take into account that, well, the, that all depends from which side of the globe you're looking at. It's because even in today... Uh, at least for most part of Europe, as far as I know, people aren't bothered by uh, this sort of caricatures, and some even embrace it in a good way. And let oh. me just uh, put this here. You know oh, what God. this is? Oh, is this the? Yep, I, I, I. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the. This is the uh, city emblem of uh, one of the towns in my country. Ah. Wow. Basically, it comes down hmm. to... Wait, should I, should I even be telling you this story to give uh, the context of what you're seeing? Sure, if it if it's fun and entertaining. <laughs> well, not so much fun and entertaining, but there is a point. Basically, a long time ago, there was this uh, nobleman who had a servant from Africa. And while they were walking through the forest one day... Well, a bear attacked him, and the servant managed to shoot a bear with a bow and arrow right between the eyes and kill him on the spot. And as uh, gratitude for his service, uh, the nobleman promised that he was going to immortalize him. Hmm. And that's how we are here. <laughs> that's awesome. And uh... I mean, for the, for the time, the depiction is quite true for the time yeah, yeah but honestly that's but, <laughs> but then again uh, american also, uh, americans also have a different perspective on, on this type of era than here oh. in europe oh yeah that's just like <laughs> americans <clears throat> very much like to be uh it's a it's like i don't know what it is but like even set like we've never Americans we've never really grown out of this like real world police mentality like <laughs> even though it's taken different forms we really do have this world police mentality and nowadays this is kind of what we think that we need to world police like especially like in going back to you know Speedy Gonzales it's just like oh Speedy Gonzales is a uh, terrible horrible uh Speedy Gonzales is a caricature. He's he's so offensive. It's, it's like he's so offensive to the Mexicans, and the Mexicans are like, "F you, we love Speedy." <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's just like I, I don't. I again, I don't know what it is about Americans. It's just like we like to be world police in so many different ways, and I don't like. Could someone explain that to me? <laughs> uh, superiority complex, maybe. As soon as I figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, but uh, the, give the, me a couple centuries. Mm, uh, I, I say this a thoughtful discussion for a, another time, and not on this show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, not on this show. From the topic. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but no, uh, it, right. it was something um, kind of like it, it makes sense, but 
for who we are and where we're placed on this earth, um, we, we have a vast amount of opinions. Um, me from Southeast Asia, we don't really care because we don't have uh, <laughs> African Americans. So, like, this is not, this, sorry, uh, this is a non topic for me because I don't have a black friend, so I got no idea. <laughs> and that is oh true. No, no, that no, is no. true. No, no. I, okay, so I, I don't real. I don't know if you realize what you just said, but it's just mm. okay. There's this kind of meme. It's just like <laughs> I'm not racist. I have a black friend. Where you're just like I have no black friends. I'm not racist. <laughs> uh, okay, I walk into that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was right there. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I, I've learned to roll with the punches. Silver. Oh. Yes. Please call upon your god and rewind time for us. Wait, I'm sorry. What did What did you say? Please call upon your god and rewind time for us. <laughs> Oh, uh, pre I'm pretty sure he's more of a you gotta live with what you done did. <laughs> yep, yep. Anywho. Uh, so, as we, as we learn of Norman's social circles and the uh, black void. <laughs> uh, the void. <laughs> oh, no. This, no, I think it's a literal black void. Okay. Uh, I, I think that this will be the highlight of this review. A study of Norman's social circles. Uh, yes. All right. Mm. I think we're... Uh, no, don't, you, don't you mean all white? No. <laughs> oh, we're losing him. Okay, no. All right. Now that that's out of the way, how about we uh, get the show on the road? Yes, 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 yes. All right. <coughs> and this is how it begins. So our story begins on the high seas where the pirates, the usual punching bag of the series. Uh, the captain is motivating the crew as they row, addressing the newcomer who's, well, derpy. Saying that they terrorize people like Phoenicians, Hispanians and the Britons. <laughs> And then when the new guys mentions the goals, they all quickly go and take ta and take care because the pirates had uh, so many bad experiences with them that <laughs> they basically become a bad omen for them. Then suddenly the guy in the crow's nest, wink wink, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the guy in the crow's nest calls out that there's a Roman ship approaching, but is unable to tell them in time that, that there's more than one ship. And then the pirate ship gets sunk by the Roman fleet, who just which just forced us right through them. So what we're seeing here is basically Julius Caesar inv invasion of Britain taking place. You see, Caesar's pretext for invading Britain was that after the conquer uh, he conquered Gaul, the survivors fled across the English Channel. I'm sorry, British Channel. <coughs> so he had uh, every intent of finishing the job before their Britain cousins uh, got any better idea. And funny enough though, uh, at the beginning of every Asterix story, uh, the narrator establishes the setting that it's uh, year 50 BC, in time when all of, Gauls all of Gaul has been conquered by the Romans. But the invasion of Britain took place on uh, 50, uh, 56th and 54th B uh, BC. And yes, there were two different uh, uh, Britain uh, invasions by Caesar. The first one ending in failed because the campaign took uh, too long and the winter was coming. Oh, and he pulled the Ned Stark. Yeah. <laughs> Romans, Romans coming, but it's cold now, they are going. <laughs> and of course, he finally introduced the third example of the typical uh, Brit. You know, the usual, oh, goodness gracious, such spectacular sight. It is, isn't it? You know, it might be a good to warn our chief. You mm -hmm. know, the usual. And last but not least, uh, we see one of the great naval kerfuffles that are witnessed in the Roman Empire. 
All because one seagull who, ne who ends up sitting on the signal uh, man's head and pisses, him so and pisses him off so much that he aggressively starts swaying about with his hands causing the catapults on the back ships to bombard those in the front. After which the legendary Briton chieftain, uh, what was it again? Cassavellanus, makes a comment about how unsporting the Romans are for beginning the game without them. But <laughs> regardless, the Romans make landfall and get on the field of battle where the Briton army is waiting for them. And the battle breaks out. In the middle of it, however, the bell starts to ring and the Britons disengage from the fight, leaving the Romans confused. And as it turns out, every time at 5 o'clock, the Britons have a break where they drink uh, hot mountain water, with just a dab of milk in it. <laughs> and after regarding their barbaric ways, the Romans expect them to resume the fighting, but they're told that it's the weekend and the, they just disperse, leaving the Romans completely flabbergasted. And this must have been going for several weeks, which is evident when the general Motus, uh, the centurion who was by Caesar's side uh, when the whole uh, invasion started, reports to him because of which they were hardly making any progress. And so uh, Caesar comes up with the most cunning plan, declaring that from now on they will only be fighting during 5 o'clock and the weekend. <laughs> and the tactic seemed to be effective as the Britons were enjoying the quiet afternoon <coughs> and were completely unprepared for the attack. And soon the Roman Empire conquered Britain. Hmm. Bit of a sticky wicket, eh, what? Yep, yep. Yes. Yep, yep. Okay, we got so far. So, uh, what do you guys think of the story so far? Who goes first? Uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, just you go for a sort of change. Uh, I'm sorry, you want me to just th say what I think about it so far? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I feel like it, it's funny, you know, play, it's like, not all, st not all playing on stereotypes is bad. Like, we could ar already see, like, what a lot of the, uh, <clears throat> we can already see what a lot of the you know, like parallels are. We drink mountain water with a. It, it's just like, yeah, that's it. The, uh, it's tea time, and you know, <laughs> there, you see them in the show. You see playing cricket and stuff. It's just like, yeah, it's just. It's that's the thing. It's just like this movie. It's like it engages in some. Well, what it thinks is harmless stereotype, and sometimes <laughs> it is, and sometimes it isn't. And the times where it is harmless stereotype is honestly kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, right. it is a, it is a cartoon, and you know it's. <laughs> it, I mean, it's funny. The <laughs> it's like I'm not I'm not going into an asterisk movie expecting like, freaking di freaking a freaking like Disney Renaissance movie, but you know, <laughs> it's like it's meant to be it's. Like, this is meant to be, you know, for... This is just meant to entertain entertain kids. And you know what? It's funny. <laughs> All right, uh, Silver? Well, I am flabbergasted to know that the Romans perfected cloning technology. <laughs> because in the scene where they disembark, you can see it's the same guy filling out an entire phalanx. <laughs> They're going to conquer with, with one soldier duplicated many times over and the power of those schnauzes. Those noses are huge. So, Silver, what you're saying is they started the Clone Wars? That's right. This is where George Lucas got his inspiration. I'm calling it now. We'll confront him and he'll be like, how did you get in my home? Followed by, how did you know about that? Uh, boys. So, I mean, it, you can tell it's not meant to be super serious. Uh, I don't know if there's ever been a case where a missed signal caused the Romans to destroy their own fleet. But with a logistical nightmare that was, that is any massive... Uh, military outpouring. I'm pretty sure that's always a possibility. 
In fact, I'm remembering some issues, uh, uh, episodes of MASH, where it turns out they were being shelled by their own side. Oh, God. <clears throat> so, I mean, mostly it's just funny, but then break for tea time. Yep, br British, we're very British. What's that you say? Very British, eh, what? Pip, pip. Pip, pip, cheero, but I find it funny. Uh, it's a decent amount of time before we actually meet any of the main characters. So, that's about all I got for the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, Norman? Well, <clears throat> the, the opening sets the tone of what to expect. And what I expect was nothing serious. This is kind of a funny haha -ha movie, and it's and the time period says so with uh, the char uh, characters and whatnot. But me not being a history buff, I was very confused by the pirate saying we we don't uh, mess with the. I heard gold, and I'm thinking, wait, what? Uh, I I don't get it. Like they don't want gold. Wait, what? Why? Aren't pirates supposed to get gold and whatnot? And it clicked on me later on that oh, this is the race and whatnot. And in my mind, I'm just thinking, okay, uh, when are they gonna call out countries that I know and so on? Not knowing that uh, back in the days they're not called what I know now. <clears throat> and the British character turf. Yeah, the British character shows are very British. Uh, to a point where, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, hey, isn't that Nigel? Thornberry? And, I yeah. also think they're not British enough. <laughs> what, really? What about you, Jacob? What do you think? <laughs> well, honestly, it's been hilarious all so far. Though the whole, uh, the reason why I said they're not British enough, like they're staring and saying the usual stereotypical British expressions, but they don't uh, use the expressions that, well, do you know what twit is? Yeah, in, in, in it, I think. A anyone who still listens to Elon Musk? Meh. <laughs> what about <clears throat> somebody saying that he's feeling chuffed? Mm, that's new to me. I I, I don't really know. Very I don't hear that very often. Out. That's what it means, chuffed. Huh. But, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. If that, no, that's I'm good, I'm good. Words, like, you ever watch Great British Baking Show? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so yeah, when you heard... When I heard the word chuffed, it always sounded negative to me. But I'm like, oh, but they were using it in such a good context. I'm like... It sounds like a negative word. It really does. <laughs> but apparently it's positive. It's a, it's the same thing it's a it's the same thing with some Aussie lingo. Like we're we're having a right rip snorter here. Like <laughs> rip snorter? That that doesn't sound positive, but apparently it is. Like I don't get it. <laughs> it's it's similar to how English say, Oh, this is the bomb. And that is supposed to be positive, but when you think well, about it, it's wait. positive depending on the context. Like, <laughs> the get, it's like, oh, this is, there's the bomb and it bombed. And or like, bombs. For, <laughs> and for a non native English speaker, that could be very confusing. Wait, oh, yeah. isn't this positive? Is, wait, now it's negative? How does that work? Uh, By, well, you got to be a free spirit about it, man. Or you can't assign meaning, man. Yeah. Or there's like the different types of sugar honey iced tea and how that putting a different word in front of it just completely changes the meaning. Like bull S is just like just lies. Dog mm -hmm. S is, oh, man, that's just poor quality. Uh, bat S is just that's just illogical. Mm -hmm. Or ape S is, uh, I don't know, like frighteningly aggressive i guess <laughs> uh horse s is just oh that that's unfair <laughs> mm, yep yep uh, or, or the f word the the f word can be 
used in so many ways. <laughs> but anyway, Jacob, carry on. Right. So, uh, several months pass, and then on the beach where it all began, Caesar gathers his legions to announce how proud he is of them. Now this Rome stands triumphant on both sides of the sea. And while he's talking about how he con- conquered both Gaul and Britain, uh, General Montus and the other, Satur- uh, and the other centurion named... Uh, hold on. How do you pronounce it? Stratocolumus. Stratocolumus. Yeah. Uh, well, the two are taking steps at each other about the village of the indomitable Gauls, as well as the last remaining Briton village that's still resisting. And then the scene uh, shifts to the said village of Britons where the warriors are manning the walls, battle ready while the chief and the skinny guy neck uh, at the entrance, uh, the former talking about how the, they may not be able to survive the next attack, uh, but then the latter brings up the idea, telling him that uh, he has a cousin living in gold and that his village managed to survive from an attack so far because they have a magic potion that gives them super strength. And then once again the scene shifts, this time to the regular setting where our heroes live. A small gold village on the northern coast. And it's a regular day in the village as everybody is going about their business, cleaning their houses as the springs finally come. And as usual a fight breaks out. And this is another rug- running gag here in the series because, well, a fight always breaks out in a village because uh, Automatics the blacksmith and Unhygienics the fishmonger, well, they start a fight with one another because uh, the, blacksmith, the blacksmith keeps telling uh, the fishmonger that his fish aren't fresh, at which point the entire village just joins in on the fight. So, and just sorry, uh, just for context, right? Uh, w- I was confused when... Uh, all of the characters starts talking, especially in Asterix Village. And I'm in my head, I'm thinking, wait, isn't Asterix kind of Nordic? Aren't they supposed to be in the Nord, uh, Nor- Norwegian part of the world? And I'm thinking, wait, they're British now? C- could somebody explain? W- w- where's this set? <laughs> they're French. They're, they're French. So wait. This is set in Brittany. Or uh, in Armory, because it's called. It was called back then. So um, the, the the British are getting attacked. Asterix has a cousin in Britain, and yes, Asterix is in France. They're they're French. Yes. Okay. Now that... both Gauls and the Britons are Celts technically, but you get the idea. Um, okay. I'm very confused. <laughs> I was very confused when watching this. May I continue? Yes, please. Right. So Asterix and Panoramix, the druid, regards the daily event. And then Obelix, Asterix's best friend, passes by with a despondent expression, not even caring about the fight. Something that they both notice. And Asterix, uh, Asterix asks the druid if there's anything that can be done for Obelix to cheer him up. And Panoramix suggests that they need a Roman legion to cheer him up since it's been weeks since he's given them a good thumping because Caesar took all everybody to invade Britain. And just as he said that, the skinny Briton guy from earlier makes himself known to them, introducing himself as Jelly, Jolly Thorax, or anti-climax in the English dub. <laughs> and of course Asterix, Asterix uh, quickly recognizes him as his cousin. And the joke falls around <laughs> the anti-climax, uh, shakes uh, his hand, but when Obelix does it, well... Let's just say he took the let's shake on it, literally. <laughs> mm. Right. Then they go to the chief and explain the whole thing, and they agree to give uh, Anticlimax the magic potion to protect the witch. But then they realize he's not able to carry the whole barrel all by himself. So of course Asterix and Obelix volunteer to accompany him, which makes Obelix very excited because he'll get to fight Romans again. Now, uh, this is where two changes from the comic uh, happen. And the first one is that uh, Obelix decides to take his puppy dogmatics with him. Now, in the original, it makes him stay put, which makes absolutely no sense because 
in the Cleopatra story, he took him along to Egypt even when Asterix told him not to do so because it's too long a journey to Egypt for such a little puppy. Well, here they're just going over the channel. So, yeah, I guess that was one fix-up they did from the original, so I guess that was good. As for the second change, well, as they depart, the scene once again shows the pirates from the beginning in their new ship. And, well, they come across uh, not Gauls nor Romans, but the Phoenician merchant ship. And as they're about to raid it, Asterix and the company come across them and Obelix eagerly jumps into it, sinking the pirate ship. And as a token of gratitude, the Phoenician merchant gives Asterix a bag of rare herbs from the Far East. This scene... Uh, this was the scene that was added because in the comic it felt sort of nonsensical because as they were at uh, the druid's hut, the one who makes the magic potion, uh, Asterix spots a handful of herbs lying on the table asking what those are and the druid answers that they're herbs that he doesn't know what to do with them so he can just take them if he wants. So, well, this and this makes sense but Here's what doesn't make sense. What are Phoenicians doing in the English, I'm sorry, British channel? Because Phoenicia, <coughs> Phoenicia was in what is uh, modern day Sierra Lebanon and Palestine. And Anachronism they spread is fun. <laughs> uh, Probably trading, I guess. That's, that's the most logical sense for them to uh, travel okay, all that way. Well, here's the thing, they spread throughout the Mediterranean Sea, but I don't recall them ever being north of France. So yeah, that comes a bit off, ah. because they were, uh, they were a maritime nation that later just got absorbed into the Roman Empire, just like Egypt was. But I, I never saw that they ever went uh, north of Hispania. So yeah, anyway, moving right along... The scene changes to the Roman galley that's returning to Gaul with the skinny centurion that was shown earlier. What was it again? Stratocolumus. He's on board. They come across Asterix's boat and the captain of the ship gets the idea of having fun by scaring them. Only to then be completely shocked when they get boarded by them. <laughs> a fight breaks out and the heroes completely demolish the ship. And all of a sudden, a thick white blanket surrounds them. Anticlimax explains that it's the fog, which means they might, be they might be getting closer to the homeland. And Obelix suggests that they could use the Roman galley to transport the magic potion to the Briton village, but Asterix refuses, saying that they'll draw too much attention to themselves. They'll draw less attention to themselves on the boat. And as they leave, Asterix asks if the Britons always have such a thick fog, and Anticlimax says it's only when it's not raining. And on cue, the heavy rain starts falling. And on the destroyed Roman galley, the captain finally wakes up and tells everybody to just leave and not speak of what just happens to them. But then the, centur but the centurion overheard what the attackers were talking about in order to the ship to turn back so they can warn everybody about the magic potion that's meant to be for their last resisting Britain village. <laughs> so, our hero finally make landfall and go to the nearby inn where they would be able to experience the first-class British meal. <laughs> Warm beer and cooked wild boar with mint sauce. <laughs> Anybody else here hate mint? Uh, uh, I'm I okay. Hate... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, the only mint I can actually stand is uh, <laughs> is wintergreen, but like peppermint. Uh, those who chew on peppermint and puff it in your face, Gilbert and Sullivan were onto something. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot stand peppermint. Uh, honestly, on my end, I I never had real like a, a real restaurant serving peppermint. Like uh, most of the time, I know it's minty, and I got no idea what it's made of. And that's usually eaten with tandoori chicken or some kind of lamb meal. And that's about it on my end. 
Yeah, but mint sauce is uh, origin it originated from uh, England. It's made from finely chopped uh, spearmint leaves soaked in vinegar and small amount of sugar and sometimes lime juice. Hmm. So hmm. yeah, I, I don't know how I don't know how I could possibly stomach something like that. See, I've only, I've enjoyed mints as like a candy or an a, some sort of after meal. I've never had it as part of the main meal. It's kind of a sauce that you dip it in just to, I don't know. It, it's how uh, lemon and fish works. It's kind of to kill the taste of the fish. I'm, I'm uh, fish has this, this taste where if you sprinkle a bit of lemon on it, it kind of neutralizes the bad taste, from what I understand. And with mint, it's kind of to get that um, gamey taste out for mutton and so on. Well, maybe one if I ever visit uh, England, perhaps I can learn. Probably. Try it out. I have never been, so need to take that off the bucket list. Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, it, I'm more hung up on warm beer. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I mean, like, oh my god! You know, it's funny. I have been to Iceland, mm -hmm. and uh, they took us on a tour of old villages, and we actually got to try uh, jerky fish and. Uh, what was it? Salted shark. Wait, shark? And the shark. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, shark. Doo -doo -doo. Well, no, I, I didn't salt the shark. I didn't do it. Ah. <laughs> but, you know, suddenly I understood why that vodka was their main drink, because the, the jerky fish was tasteless and the salted shark was bitter. And you just remember, people, back then... The, we're spoiled by our culinary options these days. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very spoiled. So very spoiled. I'm, I'm tempted to order something right now and have it delivered. Yay. Don't have to go out and kill a shark to do it. Oh, man. Yeah. But don't do it. Just like, don't do it. Resist the temptation. Always order pickup. Don't order <laughs> delivery. Is, is there a big difference in pricing? There's a huge difference in pricing. Like a lot of these, like, like DoorDash, Uber Eats, and Postmates always nickel and dime you with like, oh, well, here's the service fee and here's like the maintenance fee. And they're just like all these little different fees that they just keep tacking on in order to like, so like a $10 sandwich jumps up to like $30. Oh god, that's a huge difference. Oof. Yeah, so <laughs> and the yeah. And the restaurant that makes the food doesn't get that money. Oh, okay, that, that that is just unfair. All right, get it done. Got it, got it, got it. Got it. Yeah, always order Who does then? The, Don't order the delivery, delivery man. <laughs> the, the, does the delivery man get all that money then? No, all it's all the money. company. Oh no. They get a, they get a, they get a press they get they get basically the delivery fee. But uh, yeah, it's like the like Uber, Uber Eats, Postmates, or uh, DoorDash. They're the one they t they take uh, a little bit of mo they take a lot of the money. But there is also the thing like I don't know if the restaurant messes up your order, like the company actually eats eats the the cost of it. So I guess that's one good thing because uh, fun funnily enough, like. It's really weird. Like whenever we order from this one McDonald's, like <laughs> they always mess up my wife's order. Like every single time. It's like they ordered one thing that it it doesn't come with cheese. The basic thing does not come with cheese, and yet they still keep adding cheese onto it. <laughs> How? I don't know. They keep messing it up. But, you know, it's just like, hey, it's like they, they say, look, you guys got my order wrong. And, uh, like, we, I mean, we don't pay it. We don't have to pay for it at that point, but I, I guess that's the positive, but it's a very strange thing because it's like saying, Hey, I, I want a cheese. Sorry, I, I want a burger, just a basic beef burger. 
and no cheese. So, okay, by default, it doesn't have cheese. Then suddenly you get cheese. Wait, wait, wait what? How? I don't understand. Because they want to cheese you off. And <coughs> not one of your better ones. Yeah. Well, well, then I'll just let it breathe. <laughs> well, okay, that was better. Thank you. Would you say that's a Gouda? Very Gouda. <laughs> All right, now we're back to the bad. Yep. But um, back on track with this one, like, I'm noticing some of the beats with um, the the story. Like, why was Obelisk... Ob- I, I'm just going to say however I'm saying. Obelisk um, moping around. <coughs> and this is one of the things that they kind of don't explain much about it in the movie. Or at least they kind of imply that, oh, he wasn't beating the Romans up that much, so that's why he's depressed. But in the comic version of this, it, he, he wants to kind of hang out with a, a kind of is in love, but um, the girl just sees him as a friend and he's kind of like, oh, I'm crushing on you so hard and so on. So that's what wait, I find. Wait, hold on. Are we talking about the same thing, Norman? Yeah, this was no, from that, the comic that's an entirely the, different story. Yeah, but but it came from the comic to this one because that's the difference I saw in the animated series versus the comics. Sorry, the movie versus the comics. Hmm. Uh, Norman, I think you're. I think you're taking a different story in the comics. Yeah, the one you're the talking gr- about is uh, Asterix and the Legionary. Isn't it the same story? Oh, no, man, we Britons. are nerds. We're arguing about comic books and adaptations and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. Oh my. All right. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> actually. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm wrong, I guess. But it feels the same because you were the one that brought up that story in the first place. Yeah, I brought up the story in the first place, but this is a completely different story now. Okay, my bad. I'm sorry. Um, disregard my environment. Yes, please. Yes, please. All right, so, well, uh, where was I? All right. Well, while the, our heroes are out in the, uh, at the inn and they're, well, warming themselves up, the skinny centurion arrives back in the Britain and warns General Motus about the threat and he immediately sends out the message to all the outlying patrols. So, while, while they're more, well, sorry. <coughs> While the gang is warming up by the fire, the innkeeper tells them that they'll have to leave soon since the Romans are very strict on when the business is closed. And just then, two legionaries come through the door, which was a sign for them to leave, but not before the tall and bulky one asks what, asks what they had in the barrel. And Asterix tells them they have warm beer, and then legionary lets them go after saying that he'd have it confiscated if, he'd have it, confiscated if it was gold wine. And then outside the United Anticlimax tells them both that before they can get to the village, they first have to pass through Londinium, the capital of Britain. And then the wagon with the legionnaire arrives to inform the patrol about the recent development. And while he's absent, the wagon they still... Well, the wagon with which he came to the inn, they steal it and run away. And also a funny note on this one... When the third legionnaire arrives to address the tall one as the Cudion Lapus, he corrects him and he says that it's Lapsus. And in the Latin, Lapsus means uh, involuntary mistake while speaking. <laughs> yeah, but it is a bit confusing on the title because <coughs> the Cudion was supposed to be a cavalry officer in the, Roman, in the Roman Legion, not the leader of a small unit. So I'm not sure what happened here. Well, maybe he pissed someone off and got got reassigned. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Anyway, the gang rides through the night and they all fall asleep, only to be then awo- woken up when their horse, horse collides with another one coming from the opposite direction. The driver addressing the fat who's been driving that he's been driving on the right side of the road because, as anticlimax explains, in Britain we drive on the right side of the road, the left one. Ah, <laughs> uh, the left side road joke. Mm, always, always a classic. <laughs> yeah. Classic. 
Yeah, and if it's not become obvious until now, Obelix is very touchy when it comes to some, but uh, to people mention the size of his girth, and he throws a temper tantrum. By now, though, the Roman legionaries from the last night managed to catch up to them, and it's surprising that they actually managed to pursue them all night long. And so, uh, seeing the enemy approach, they drive off the road straight to some guy's lawn. Wrecking it completely after he boasted how it will be perfect after 2,000 years. <laughs> and then he just decides to stop the patrol with his own spear out of frustration, allowing the heroes to escape. And uh, after that event, the skinny centurion uh, Statocolomus reports back to Motus about the failure to capture the Gauls, and that uh, they're in Londinium now. So Motus uh, orders to search the whole city, confiscate the vine barrels. And when they're caught, he'll serve them to the lions in mint sauce. Only to then, only to then comment, poor lions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And now, uh, I've been wondering for a bit, but can a centurion also be a prefect? I'm asking that because th that's one of the changes from the comic where uh, Lundinium is ruled by a prefect. But here it's a military leader in charge who was by Caesar's side from the start, and I think they made this change to have a constant antagonist be present, whereas in the comic there's so many different characters that basically just disappeared later, that, later down the line. Well, personally, I, I don't think it's possible. After all, nobody's prefect. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. No. I can feel Josh biting down on a retort. He's trying to hold it in, but it rages. Oh, please. And what follows uh, is another change of a comic. You see, in the comic, the group arrives during the daytime, and they show people cheering on the streets around... Uh, sorry. They show people cheering on the street, surrounding a group of most popular bars in the city which is a clear Beatles reference. But here they arrive late at night and the patrols are going about the streets of Londinium, so Asterix and the company sneak about to a nearby inn, which is run by a gull immigrant from uh, Marseille, some uh, guy called Olive Scatefix, but who's, well, the local just call, call him Gullis because uh, his name is difficult to remember and pronounce. And he's a complete chatterbox. And they ask him to hide the barrel away while Obelix dreads whether or not they'll be eating uh, cooked boar with mean sauce again. But his fears are eventually quelled when the innkeeper reveals that uh, he has a cell where he keeps all the fine food from back from Gaul. And then the legionary trio, led by Lapsus, that's been, tra that's been chasing them since the day before, pass uh, by and go inspect the very place where they hid. And so Golex has to hit the guys uh, in the cell while, while they're inspecting the place. And after, inspe uh, after the inspection uh, ceases, one of the legionaries says that they didn't find anybody else on the premises, but that they, there's a lot of barrels. So they confiscate them all despite the innkeeper's pleading, and warn him that if the barrel they're looking for has his name on it, he'll be sorry. Golex moves because, well, he no longer has any wine, and he's probably been completely ruined after he discovered that Obelix basically uh, ate the entire cell full, full of food that he stored. <laughs> and then he switches back to the palace. The two centurions, Motus and Satacolomus, are overseeing the barrels from the city getting rolled in, and the former uh, orders the legionnaires to open all the barrels and taste them, so they can find the magic potion. Which they do by order and discipline. At first, because as it expected, after a night's long binging, mm -hmm. all the soldiers got blank drunk. Screaming and singing in the midst of all the chaos, one of them opens the barrel and unknowingly drinks the magic potion. And then quickly punches one of the guys who got the idea of getting too close to his barrel, and then he beats up all the other guys in the cellar as well. So the morning comes, and Asterix and uh, the rest go off in their wagon to the palace to get the barrels back, hoping that they haven't found it yet. 
And this is where a joke about the imperial system is cracked. <laughs> Asterix uh, asks uh, Anticlimax if the palace is far, and he, answer, and he answered that it's only a few feet away. And Obelix is confused by what feet he's talking about. And Anticlimax explains that the Romans measure distances in paces, while the Britons measure it in feet. And Obelix is still confused, and he says, Six feet equals one pace. <laughs> Which uh, Obelix responds with the usual phrase when he hears a load of nonsense. These Britons are crazy? <laughs> so yeah, uh, we got so far. Anyone else got a comment on the, on the story so far? Mm. Mm, I, I've got several. <laughs> All right, see what please do. Well, first off, the skinny Roman uh, reporting to the centurion... The, it's the joke of him slipping on the marble floor down the hallway and breaking all the statues gets played out way too much. Three times in total. Uh, three times in total, and I know that mostly comedy is rule of threes, but it's just the same thing over and over for an extended period. But you know, like it be. I think it would have been funnier if after the first incident. He just comes through the door each time with a different broken statue, and that's all you need. Mm -hmm. That is true. Well, on the last one, he does. He... Well, by that point, I'm just rolling my eyes. Yeah, but is the joke being hammered so many times that it's kind of, okay, the first one was a visual gag. The second one should have just been a scene at the door with sound effects going in, and... Uh, the guard, what was his name again? Uh, General Motus. Yes. Yeah, G General Motus just holding a part of a statue, and the third one would just be nothing. Uh, he brings in good news, and on the way out, things break. That's comedy. But and then we, in terms of comedy, we switch to Obel Obelix. I keep wanting to say obelisk, mm. the tormentor, uh. obliterate. But uh, he becomes the major comedic force throughout this. But I don't know, when, he, when he's eating a guy out of house and home and basically just getting in everybody's way, I'm like, oh, boy, this is this is going to be a slug. Oh, I, I totally agree with that one. Like, when, w w when watching the movie... And this this is why I meant when the start of the first um, impressions. Like, I watched it. I have to take a nap before I can finish watching it. Because Obelisk, um, really took it out of uh, took it out of me. Like I I just felt like he was. How how would I put this? He was dragging the movie down for me, even though he's kind of the main character but yeah he, he he just starts problem after problem after problem even uh when they found a the barrel and asterix tells him not to drink that that's bad for you and he drinks it and got pissed drunk and starts to fight the romans on the street for no good reason and is arrested somehow oh god i, I mean isn't that abs absolutely in character for obelix I guess, but at the same time, too, like, oh god, like, hmm. Well, if if too it, much of that that character. I know, I, yeah, I do know that, but it's just like, on one hand, that is absolutely in character for Obelix. Like, if you look at a lot of the comics, it's uh, the person who usually instigates the conflict is either, like, the rest of the Gaulish village or, like, or Obelix. Like, I can count on, I think I like on one hand, the amount of times where I've seen that the person who w was the problem was Asterix. Mm. And, but that's the funny thing. Asterix really does not stand out in this movie. He's not making many decisions. He's not, he doesn't have a strong reaction to when the wine is stolen or when Ob Obelix uh, causes trouble. I'm like, I have to remind myself he's the title character because he ain't doing diddly squat. 
But final comment is on the Roman detail as they inspect the wine barrels. That is a cush gig. Mm-hmm. That's a re- that's a reward for a job well done. We need to sample all this, or perhaps it's a it's a job poorly done. We don't know what you'll be drinking, so have fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it depends. Yeah, and I I kind of knew where this was going. Like, yeah, they're they're wine testing, but they're not spitting it out. They're they're just consuming it, and they're not even taking a small sip. They're taking a mugful. And yeah, I I can clearly tell where this is going. Anyway, okay, is that all? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's it for me. me. All right, all right. So as we continue, they finally arrived at the palace, but they face literally no resistance in entry because all the soldiers are completely hammered. Only for them to find the lone legionnaire who beat everybody else. He, he sees Obelix and he calls to him, You too fat guys, only to get smacked across the room. They find Golex's barrels but they can't tell which one is theirs. And Obelix suggests that they just drink them, uh, try drinking them to see which one is it. But Asterix argues that it's too dangerous to do it here and they get all the barrels out. Uh, they put all the bells back on the wagon, but not before Obelix gets drunk. So yeah, you beat me to the punch a bit, uh, Norman. Uh, and as they ride through the city, Obelix starts loudly singing. In English, he's singing some something in French, but in the original, I'm pretty sure he sings Rue Britannia. <laughs> But yeah, Asterix tells him to shut up and then Oblix starts crying that he doesn't love him anymore and he has to reassure him. And then he says that if the Romans try to hurt him, he'll give him what for. And just on time, a Roman patrol passes by and Oblix immediately attacks him, forcing Asterix and uh, Anticlimax to uh, help him to make sure he doesn't get hurt in his drunken state. But as they leave the wagon, the self-proclaimed thief of abandoned wagons appears and steals it while they're not looking, and only Dogmatics r- runs after him. And without uh, their help, Publix manages to beat the patrol on his own, only to them pass out. And so they drag him back to Golk so they can go look uh, after the storm bar- in barrels while he sleeps. And back at the palace, the legionaries uh, recover, sort of, and are being chewed, chewed out by General Motus, and Stratocolumus notices that uh, the barrels of the innkeeper Golex went missing, so he sends them to Golex's place to arrest anybody they find there. In the meantime, Obelix and the Anticlimax have searched the whole city and couldn't find the thief, only to then come across a barrel with Golex's name on it. And after a bit of persuasion, the owner reveals that uh, a man named Fiddlesticks, or Sassafrax in the original one, was the one who gave it to him. They return back to Golex's place only to discover that the whole place has been sacked, and the woman next door tells them that the Romans came and took them to Londinium Tower. And inside the tower, uh, Obelix finally wakes up confused where he is, and Golix tells him that nobody's ever left the tower alive, screaming that even if they torture him, torture him, he'll be completely quiet, much to Obelix's frustration since he's suffering from a nasty hangover. And of course, he doesn't care about uh, where they are, and quickly shows uh, that there's no point in trying to stop him as he rips out the iron shackles and then forces his way down the tower, only for the Asterix to then come uh, in from the other side and making his way up where he was, looking for him not knowing he already left. And after that uh, spectacle, once again Stratocolumus reports to Motus that the Gauls escaped, and then Motus starts threatening him that he's gonna drown him in warm beer if if he doesn't catch him. If he doesn't catch them, after which he breaks down crime because of all the frustrations he's been going through. Now, this is where I have to note there's a difference from the comic again. So in the original, the innkeeper, innkeeper is just some random Briton guy, 
and his place gets completely ransacked. And I didn't mention this uh, earlier the, before... Uh, what was it? Um, oh yeah. When uh, the skinny centurion comes into the office the second time and the... Uh, Matus uh, orders him to uh, search the city, but in the English, I don't know why he's why he said ransacked because I've seen what ransacked is, and in the comic it shows what uh, ransacked building looks like. I don't know. It, was it this because of the uh, lip sync problems because they couldn't get the right words to sync up properly, or am I missing something? But whatever. So anyway, back to the change. Uh, when Obelix finally gets them out of the tower, the innkeeper goes to his relatives, uh, to one of his relatives, and he reveals to him the barrel with his name on it and from whom he got it. But here in the movie, after they escape the tower, Golix just disappears from the plot completely. <laughs> Thanks for wrecking my home and livelihood. See ya! <laughs> Never mind that the uh, Romans are probably going to come looking for him. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to have to run for my life and uh, never know peace again. See ya! <laughs> yeah. And in the meantime, while this is happening, Dogmatic, Dogmatics has been going about and looking for the barrel to be found to find it. Uh, well, he found the missing barrel in one of the houses. Uh, as well as a very large, as well as encountering a very large, possibly a rabbit bulldog, and luckily he managed to get a taste of the magic potion before sending him right up the tree, and the same tree that Asterix and the rest uh, pass some time later. And all the while they're being uh, secretly pursued by the Colonel Lapsus and the other two legionnaires from before. Who then get their rear ends uh, beaten and ripped by the bulldog who managed to get down for the tree by then. Now the group's looking for the house and at first they come to the wrong one because the houses uh, all look the same and only thanks to uh, Roman num numerals they're recognizable and well they're looking at number 16 but they came to the wrong house because the house was actually 17 but one of the eyes fell out. And in the meantime, the Dogmatics gets back to the house where the barrels were and finds the owner who just sold another barrel to somebody. And Fiddlesticks thinks he'll have his time dealing with a tiny little nuisance using only a newspaper. But oh boy, did he make a mistake! Which becomes evident when Obelix finally breaks down the right door and finds his puppy and they're finally reunited. They find one of the missing barrels, but the magic potion is not in it. And after some persuasion from Obelix and the comments from the neighbors about how loud they are next door, the thief relents and gives them the list of his customers. Now, in the comic after this, what follows is a lengthy process of elimination as the gang goes uh, all over the place looking for the barrel that has a magic potion, all the while being pursued by the legionaries. But here uh, it's just reduced to the first person on the list that bought the barrel. The was the right guy, the captain of what was it? Camel Dunum? No, hold on, Camel Dunum. Yeah, Camel Dunum rugby team. Mm. And they go to the stadium, and there the legionaries change into civilian outfits in order to hide in the crowd, while the gang watch the game play out. I don't need to explain how rugby is played, do I? No, it's all good. Nope. Mm. All right. Have you ever seen a brawl? Now pretend there are rules. That's rugby. <laughs> how different is Although rugby from the American quote-unquote football? Uh, well, well, for well, American football, it's uh, it's mo, it's uh, the game actually. It's like uh. <laughs> the the games actual like the times when people move actually last a little bit longer than like five seconds. <laughs> There's also uh, you know that's uh, also rugby has a dance routine that's also different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dance routine. Yeah, if you kiwi, but 
Other than that, I think it's just normal. Oh no, I played rugby in Kenya. Uh. It's like there were dance routines. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Meanwhile, in American style football, you just have your heart break as your team loses by fifty bleeding points. Bro, let me tell you, my dad is a Chargers fan. So wait a second, Josh. Can you play rugby? Oh yeah, I was. Uh, I was. <laughs> uh, depending on the day, I was either a lock or a tight head prop. Mm. You didn't catch it, did you? Can <laughs> Kenya play rugby? Oh. Uh... <laughs> Man, I was going to re- right over my head. <laughs> yep, same here. Yeah. I got you just over like, this one, Silver. Mm, just like the Broncos trying to to catch a goal, oh, it is right over the head. Oh boy, we we had a bad season. Mm. But uh, speaking of the rugby stadium and the design of Londinium in, in uh, general, we got to skip this aesthetic. That basically it is London rendered in wood. Mm. So we have steampunk, which shows a futuristic side uh, in Victorian. But now he, Asterix is wood punk. <laughs> showing vast constructions of dead trees that match modern times. They've even got a sundial Big Ben. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the drawbridge. <laughs> And the drawbridge, and the Tower of London, mm-hmm. Londinium, and the and the uh, rugby stadium. So I'm just like, wow, they're really good builders. Yeah, and they do incorporate stone in their buildings, but somehow most of the other stuff are wood. Like the stadium, you mentioned silver. I'm looking at it now, and it's fully wooden. Yeah, I guess that's the joke. Well, I don't know. The humor's a bit wooden. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Do I continue? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Right. So the game plays out, and in the middle of it, one of the players who was short and skinny for some reason compared to the rest of the hulking guys gets dogpiled and injured. The medics are brought out and they give him a chalice of wine that also seems to have a... Uh, it came from the barrel that had Golex's name on it. And as expected, it was the magic potion. Evident from the guy jumping on his feet right away and running onto the field smacking all the big guys to the side. So the gang springs into action only for Oblix to then run after the player that holds the ball because he started to like uh, this game the Britons were playing so much. Meanwhile, Asterix and Anticlimax try to barter with the medic about buying the wine. Soon, however, the disguised legionaries come after them, and Asterix orders Obelix to make a run for it, while he's going about the field with the ball. He grabs the barrel and the whole field just starts chasing after them. And Anticlimax tells Obelix to return the ball so they can finish the game, which obliges throwing it straight at uh, the Codion Lapsus, who then gets dockpiled by all the other players. And they manage to get out of the stadium and onto a boat, finally hang them on to reprieve as they'll be fine in the village uh, at a short amount of time, only to then get halted by a Roman galley that Centurion Stratocolumus brought up the river. And after refusing to surrender, he orders the catapult to fire and it hits their boat, sinking it and destroying the barrel with the magic potion in the process. And the, and the rule of three here plays out. Wait, or is, is, is this the fourth one? When uh, Stratocolumus uh, returns back to Londinium and tells General Motus where he reports what happened and then Motus uh, orders to gather the legions to prepare for the attack on the village at dawn. Was this the fourth time or was it the third time? I think that's the third one because it's good news. No, wait. Oh, now I remember. This is the fourth time. The first one was the one where he reports uh, 
uh, where the where the whole thing started. The second one he reported uh, where they evaded them. The third one he reported where they escaped from the tower. So this was the fourth one, and this one doesn't actually show the mayhem happen because it doesn't happen. And the Stratocolumbus brings in the full, completely full statue. <laughs> Although, can we talk about this rugby game for a minute? Remember, kids, if you're having trouble, just drink a questionable uh, brew. It will enhance you and make you a winner. Yeah. Holy crap. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I did not put that together. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> performance enhancing brings wonders yeah ain't that all sports you know funny enough that's all actually also a team of another asterisk story about the olympic games where it's basically a plot point oh god oh well there we go at least they're owning up to it <laughs> Also, the cloning technology is in full effect again, as all the rugby players literally look the same, except for the scrawny guy, who's just a scrawny version of the others. <laughs> I mean, the We're, cloning process didn't I mean, go well for him. I'm just trying to picture, like, this lab built entirely out of wood with, like, <laughs> cloning vats of tree sap or something. <laughs> oh, boy. Makes sense, I guess. Asterix, the Clone Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Right. Anyone else got a comment? I'm good. Gosh! All right. Any final comments? Uh, no, 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 not final comments. But a comment on what's just happened with the rugby and whatnot. I mean, I already said. I already thought about. I already said. I think I already said my piece. Like, oh wow! I didn't put that together. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> All right. I have no innocence. <laughs> so, as we uh, continue, on the bank where the boat sank, uh, the gang finally climbs out up, up on the shore, and the anti climax uh, laments the current situation regarding his village. And Obelix tries to reassure him that even without the magic potion, they'll beat the Romans, but. Asterix is in deep thoughts, unable to believe that they ended up here after all they've gone through with Roman pirates and the Phoenicians. And then suddenly he gets an idea, Pull, and he pulls uh, out the bag of herbs that the merchant gave him as a thanks for rescuing them, him from uh, from him from the pirates, and they make their way to the village. In the Briton village, it's late at night. And the chief is low on hope as the Romans are going to attack any moment now and anti-climax was yet to show himself. And he finally enters the house he's positively chuffed that he's back and inquires about the mag magic potion. Uh, anti-climax is pulling a sour face about revealing what happened, but then Asterix announces that they'll make the potion right away. And as the chief goes to guard the warriors, both Obelix and anti climax are confused how he's gonna make the magic potion when he's never done it before, and from uh, oriental herbs of all things. And he whispers to them he'll explain it all later. Morning comes, and General Motus is on the field just outside the village, addressing the army as they prepare to attack, and in, in the meantime, Obelix puts the herbs into a cauldron full of hot water and the Brit Britons drink it with great satisfaction. The Romans charge the entrance of the village and then Asterix stops them uh, in the last moment, declaring that they survived and that they have the magic potion. And the whole army is quickly demoralized. And then the Britons, along with Asterix and Obelix, charge out in the Roman army lies broken on the field by the end. And so the chief thanks Asterix for his help in bringing him the magic potion, but that's when he reveals that what he gave them wasn't really it. And the chief uh, says that he suspected something was off, but regardless his, his men believed that they were truly invincible and that's what's counted and then request to send them more of those herbs and that they'll make a natural drink of it. Well, truth be, t truth be told, 
what also helped was the fact that the Roman art was thrown into a complete disarrated uh, critical moment because of mind games. But here's also something that's different from uh, from the comic, is, uh, this goes way back at the start. Because uh, in the comic, uh, Asterix and everybody else uh, come to the village and they explain that they lost the magic potion and everything's down and dreary and then he pulls out the handful of herbs he found uh, the druids had back home and he tells them that they'll make a magic potion out of that so yeah I think the movie does it better because they sort of uh, m make people believe that they'll they didn't uh, make them lose hope from the start because I don't know it sort of uh, feels off that they suddenly believe that they'll make a uh, magic potion from what uh, Asterix had in his uh, pocket after he just told them that they lost the one that was meant to be delivered to them. So, anyway. Anti uh, with the battle over, uh, Anticlimax suggests that uh, they Asterix and Oblix stay for the feast, but after the chieftain mentions uh, warm beer and cooked boar with mint sauce, Oblix immediately makes a run for it. Asterix apologizes for it and he follows him. Mm -hmm. And as they, lead, as they leave, Anticlimax comments about the French running away. Ah, mm. uh, boys. And on the way back to gold, the duo come across pirates who got their third ship now. But they promptly sunk themselves, so they wouldn't do it instead. <laughs> and as they come back home, they have a feast in the village in honor of their successful mission. Obelix finally getting his fill. And when Asterix explains that they made the fake magic potion from the herbs, uh, he shows a handful of them to Panoda Mix, the druid. Asking him if he knows what this is, and he answers that it's tea. Yeah. And and then uh, w he wonders if the English liked it, before correcting himself and saying the Britons. And with that, the story ends. So, <sighs> yeah, we've come to an end. Uh, final thoughts. Let's start with you, uh, Norman. All right. Um, the movie overall was entertaining and fun, but it was dragging in places. Um, Obrix was one of those characters that really didn't hit me in the right way. It, it made me feel like, oh god, um, why are you this way? Um, why, why? And it just made me feel like, ah. Uh, uh, you're you're just the bumbling idiot that uh, stumbles into trouble and kind of make the story go from here. Mm. But overall, it was fun with the stories and whatnot. And if you're a historical buff, I'm guessing you'll scream and shout at the screen saying this is wrong, this is right. But yeah, for me, it was okay. Um, animation, right. animation-wise, for the time, it looks smoothed. It looks smooth. It looks really good. Uh, with how I, I paid close attention to the um, ship door when the Romans were um, conquering, and the way that the plank just falls down, bends, and like those, those kind of animation style are a choice. And it looks really good. But yeah, uh, animation is fun. Story is interesting. And yeah, it, overall it's fun. It's fun. Alright. Josh, what about you? Well, yeah, it's just, I think the... But I think what I was mostly focusing on because I couldn't uh, understand like a lot of the jokes other than the slapstick was the animation. And again, yeah, like... For the time, the animation is pretty solid. Like, and yeah, there were 
like a, quite a few jokes that I did. I didn't need to understand the language or I could kind of glean things through like tone and context. And yeah, I did get a few laughs, but yeah, it does drag in places like there, there was a, like, as you said, there were some places that could tighten up or, you know, like a little more proper use of the rule of three. And yeah, I guess I was, didn't, <laughs> Again, I, because I watched it in the original language, I guess I couldn't really follow the plot. I guess I kind of tried to figure out where <laughs> I guess I kind of invented my own plot because I could only pick up a few words here and there. But, hmm. I mean, I had a good time. I mean, I think that's what this movie is. It's just, you know, it's a it's a good time. It's a it's a five or six out of ten. Like, you know. Probably not gonna watch it again, but you know, it's a it's a like a nice waste of a n- nice waste of an hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I totally agree with you on that one. It's not great, but it's good. <clears throat> All right. Then let's not lose silver. Uh, let's see here. I I too was impressed by the animation. I found it very fluid and uh, enjoyable. And I love I love the designs, especially of Londinium, and all the and all the winks and nods to modern culture. As has been said, they could tighten up the pacing in places, and I think Obelix was overused as a comedic foil. I understand that uh, he's the instigator in many problems, but there comes a point where you're like, okay we need something more. Otherwise this guy is now I'm just picturing of mice and men and asterisks having to give, well, that, that smothering hug. Mm. So, yeah. because this, this guy is just making too much racket. Yeah. yeah. Asterix. No, no, continue. continue. Asterix didn't become an active character in the story until the very end where, uh, he, has the idea for the herbs up until that point things happen and he doesn't even react that strongly to him he's not worried about missing uh barrels of magic potion or uh his friend being captured it's just like well, okay let's go take care of this so there's very little investment in the conflict because even the main characters don't seem that invested but overall, it is it is fun. It is inoffensive, aside from <laughs> a few character designs. And but I would think I will check out other Asterix movies before I revisit this one. All right. But yeah, the, it's for me. Well, uh, I I don't know how to put it. I think. Uh, this is probably one of my uh, favorite uh, favorite Asterix uh, movies because well, it is it is technically the most uh, how do I put it? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, consistent, yeah, it's consistent with the original source material from which it was made because all the other Asterix movies except for. Uh, Let's say the one after this one. I think they uh, they have multiple stories uh, coupled together into one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just remember I watched this as a kid, and it just sort of stuck in my head. Like I watched it probably so many times that even without subtitles, I can get what uh, they're saying, and I'm don't I don't even speak French. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I still also see the problems that uh, you guys mentioned. And uh, in the original story, uh, Obelix doesn't have such a big uh, what you Rule? Track, mm. r- track record of being uh, butt of the joke or whatever. I mean, he still gets drunk, but it's not that much. Drunk on warm beer. Is there any crueler fate? Actually, it's uh, wine. Not, uh, drunk on wine? He got drunk on wine. He's, he didn't like the warm beer. Yeah. It was probably vinegar wine. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 
don't think there's anything more for me to add on this one. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'm gonna hang, hand it on to uh, you now, Norman. Alright, and I guess we can wrap it up. So, anyway, if you guys have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at themvshowgmail.com. Or you can reach us on the Twitters. The show's Twitter account is at MBS Show. And my personal Twitter account is at Norman Sanzo. Silver, where can the good people find you? On Twitter, YouTube, and DeviantArt under MLP Silver Quill. And on YouTube, if you do a search for Silver Quill and After the Fact, I shall appear. If you don't include Silver Quill, you get some news program. But I was there first. And uh, let's see, I also have weekday puns, and I uh, will be seeing people in Dallas for HarmonyCon. Ooh, that's going to be fun. That's my hope. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Jacob, what about you? Uh, you can find me on the DeviantArt under the username Yakafon Torka, under the Twitter username Tales of the Ashes. If you're interested in reading the story Tomo Rising, you can find it on ToonFiction.net. And if you're interested in reading an original story featuring anthropomorphic animals in medieval fantasy setting called Tales of the Ashes, you can find it on the TalesOfTheAshes.com. Awesome, awesome. And Josh, where can the good people find you? Uh, you can find me on uh, YouTube at Josh Scorcher. Uh, you can also find me on my uh, D- my uh, TTRPG-related channel, Dragonfinder Gaming. You can also find me on Twitter. You can uh, find me on Bandcamp where I do my weird uh, par- parody songs. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's where you can find me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Go do so. And I'm going to check out the TTRPG channel. Like I mentioned before, I play a lot of D&Ds with my friends. I'm going to see what inspiration I can take from them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash MBS show. With every support, you get a week's early access to review and discussion podcast exclusive and deleted content. And a huge thank you from me. Talking about thank yous, I would like to thank Jacob, Lucky Knight, and myself, Like. Thank you so much, guys. You are great. So anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am the Silver Quill. I'm Jacob. I am the Josh Squatcher. And we'll, guys, catch you next week with another fun episode of the MBS show. See ya. See ya. Adios. Bye bye. Au revoir. That was an amazing show. Pip pips. Cheerio. All around. Yes. But now, Norman, we've got to introduce you to some more people and uh, try to fill that uh, black void in your social life. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. I hope you don't get canceled for that. (laughs) Oh, Mm. You say that and I'm scratching my brain right now just to see on my um, friends list. I don't have one. (laughs) 